today I want to take a look at a small language called BrainFuck. And the reason for that is that if you're familiar with my channel, then you know that my main series is building an interpreter in Rust for like fully fledged a normal object oriented programming language. But uh, this language BrainFuck is uh, very small. Uh, so it should be easy to write an interpreter and it'll let me test some of the uh, design choices and structures that we uh, that we use when we write an interpreter. So let's uh, let's get started. Let's call it brain rust and let's see. So what is the language actually? It's quite simple. You can write it in 11 lines, apparently. So the first thing is that there's this concept of a data tape. That is just an infinite tape. Uh, we start at zero and it goes infinitely in the negative direction, infinitely in the positive direction. And it's assumed that every value, so it's like an infinite array, and it's assumed that every value of the array uh, starts with the starts with the value of zero. Every entry of the array starts with the value of zero. Then there is a data pointer which tells you at which uh, point in the array are we. Then there is an instruction list which is a list of instructions. So that is equivalent to the program that is the program, like we would write a program in Python and Rust or whatever. And there is an instruction pointer which is where are we in the instruction list. And that pointer can jump back and forth because uh, we have uh, things like loop constructs and things like that. So the pointer doesn't, just, doesn't just go from 0 to 1 to 2 3. It can go from 10 to 5 and so on. It can jump back and forth. And then we come to the actual instructions. There's an instruction uh, with this symbol which moves the data pointer to the right. Then we have the uh, opposite direction move. Then we have a plus, which increments the current data field. We have a minus, which, which decrements it. We have a, a dot, which prints the current value uh, to std out. So, and it con it's converted to ASCII. So for example, if the value is 97, we print A. Uh, I think 97 is lowercase a. Then there is a comma, which reads a character. And then there is the looping construct, uh, which is an open uh, bracket. And it looks at the current data field. And if it is zero, then we skip the loop uh, and we go to the matching uh, close bracket. On the other hand, if we encounter a close bracket and the current field is non-zero, then we go back to the open bracket. So the way, the way it works is, let's say we have something like this with something inside. This is in the program list. And then here is perhaps the, the data tape and there's something. And this is the current value. The current value is zero. So we hit the open bracket. We see that the value is zero. So that means we have to move the instruction pointer to the close bracket. Then uh, technically we can just jump past the close bracket uh, because uh, it's zero, so that will cause us to jump past anyway. So actually we can go here. Now on the other hand, if we have like a seven, then when we hit this one, uh, we'll see that the field is not zero. So that means we go into the loop and then we Let's say maybe it's replaced with six when we go through the loop. Then we hit this one, we see it's non-zero. So we go back, go through the loop again. Now it becomes five. And uh, I think you get the point. Eventually it goes to zero. Um, oops. What's happening? I don't know. Uh, ah, I like this, sorry. Anyway, so it goes to zero and then we exit the loop. So that's how you can make a looping constructs in this language. So with that in mind, let's uh, start coding. 
the first thing I want is to uh, add a module that contains all the tokens of this language. The tokens are the allow characters in a program. Uh, so let's let's make a new module that we call token. Wonder why it uh, complains. Okay, it is because it cannot find the token yet. So uh, let's make that file. So here's how we're going to model it. Uh, we have an enum that is a token and it has a variant for each of the different allowed tokens. Now, in addition to this, we want to allow comments and comments is basically anything else. Uh, but we kind of want to store what is in the comments. Uh, so we will give it a value of string and the way it works is basically let's say we have a program here is a, a valid program and then we can also just write some text here we see the if then when we pass it we want to take this text and put it into this comment type maybe we can use that for nice formatting So the next step is to jump to main and uh, then we want to define a new um, a new module that we will call the parser. And then we open the parser and let's start coding that. So here is my first implementation uh, idea. First we want to tokenize, which is just to take a string which is a source code and turn it into a vector of tokens. So to do that, I create a mutable array, a mutable vector. I also create some intermediate variables, a comment string that I use to store the comment and a comment flush, which tells me when to, um, um, when to uh, put things into the comment and co you know collect a comment. Uh, at the beginning of each character, I set comment flush to true, and it's only sw uh, switched to false if I actually see a, something that is not an instruction, but something that is a comment character. Then I mass match on the current uh, character, and depending on the character, I make the corresponding token. And then if I'm allowed to flush and the comment string has a length greater than zero, then I make a token, um, a, a comment token and push that into the tokens vector. I clear the current com comment um, and then I go to the next iteration of the loop. Finally, when this function is done, we return tokens and we should be good to go. Let's try the test for this. The first test just looks like this. Now to get this to work, you can see we need to be able to uh, equate two things. So let's try to implement that. And we can try to just uh, derive partial eek. But I don't think it will work necessarily. We definitely don't want that. And yeah, we can add debug. So now we have this. Let's try to see if it works. It doesn't work because we cannot move this. We need to clone it. And this is an unused assignment, which we can delete. And now we have run test running and it's passing. Let's make another test that also has 
a couple of comments. So we can have a test that looks more or less like this. Again, we start with some instruction char characters, then we start with something that's not an instruction character, uh, i.e. it's a comment. A couple of more instruction characters, and then another comment. Uh, it should produce nine tokens, the four we had before, and then a comment token containing this is a comment, three increment tokens, and then another comment token um, with the content comment two. Let's see if that runs. It does not run because of because of what? So it has a problem with the length here. Let's just uh, debug print this thing. And it, of course, it does not like this. And a vector of tokens cannot be printed normally, it can only be debug printed. So we have move left twice, if we look up here, move left twice, right, one increment, a comment. Ah, and of course, that is because we push as soon as we see a comment, uh, as soon as we see a character, and Then we, at the end of that, after that, we push the comment. So let's fix that. So here's another way we can do, use this function. I'm not sure what this warning is. Um, but now instead of this uh, comment flush flag, we create a token in each iteration of, for each character. This is actually an optional. So if we get a, an instruction, we make some and then the instruction. Otherwise, we make it none. Now, if we get some token, then we may have to push a comment. We will clear the current comment and push it onto the, the token uh, list. And then we always push the token. So let's try running this. It still failed. But now we have move left, move left, move right, move right, comment, increment, increment, increment. Now, the reason it fails now is that we're always missing the last comment. It's never pushed uh, because we don't see a, a token at the end. So let's copy this and put it here and format it a bit more nicely. And I guess we should be able to run. Okay, don't know if that worked. But with that, we should run cargo test. And now the test is passing. And with that done, I think we're finished with the tokenizer. However, that being said, let's also add a little bit of error handling in here. So what can happen is that the input can be um, invalid if we have uh, if we don't have matching open and closing brackets. So let's add a variable we call bracket count and let's make it mutable. Now every time we see one of these uh, open or closing brackets, uh, we should increment the bracket count. So here we will we will uh, increment it, and over here we should uh, we should decrement it. Let me add it in the same place. Now, if we f and reach the end of the instructions, uh, end of the source code, and the bracket count is not zero, it means there's some unbalanced parentheses. So let's add a check for that. If 
it's not zero, then we will just panic and say unbalanced brackets. And we won't do anything more fancy. We will simply panic. And now we can run a quick test that this uh, error handling works. And we will do that by making a test that should panic. And we will call it uh, unbalanced tokenize. So we will add something. Uh, my mistake. You will add something here that is some uncomplicated or complicated things like this. Now it's unbalanced and when we pass it, it should panic. So we can actually delete this when we tokenize it rather. And this is unused, so we can mark it as unused. Now you will notice it doesn't care how these are facing. And that means that something like uh, this is also a valid input as far as the tokenizer is concerned, but it's actually not a valid program uh, because this one doesn't have a matching. So actually another thing we can do to handle that specific case is, uh, well, let's add the test case first. We can like pretend we're doing a test driven development. And we will say that this one is called unmatched tokenize. And let's do this example exactly. And delete that. So it should also panic, but it won't panic because we haven't implemented it yet. So let's, ru let's run the tests. Here we go. One failure, unbalanced. Uh, no, unmatched tokenize, as you can see here, doesn't panic. So let's go and add that. And what we can do is we see here that we should always open a bracket first. And that means that bracket count actually should always be greater than zero. Because otherwise we've had too many closed brackets. So at the end of the loop, it's perhaps not the nicest code we can say, that, but we can say that if the bracket count is less than zero, then we have unbalanced brackets. Or rather, unmatched brackets to keep with the same lingo. I don't know if it's correct. Run the test again, now the test is passed. So this is actually all we need to do for passing of this super simple language. So now let's think about how we will model the program and how we will run it. So here's a way we can model the program itself. I've added a new module called program, added the corresponding statement in main, and inside program, I model the four things that I mentioned in the beginning. We have a data pointer, which can point to anywhere from minus infinity to plus infinity, now, that means uh, we need to support negative and positive numbers. Obviously, we cannot, or perhaps we could represent arbitrarily large uh, numbers, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to use a 32-bit integer, a signed integer, and the same for the instruction pointer. Then we have the instruction list, which is simply a vector of tokens, the one we just passed. And then we have the data tape, which is supposed to be an infinitely long tape going both to negative infinity and positive infinity. However, it's pretty hard to have an infinite list in a computer with finite memory, unless you're working with Haskell and lazy evaluation. So we're going to do it in kind of a simple way. We'll use a hash map that points from a location on, uh, on the tape, which is the first entry to uh, the value, uh, the data value that is present there. We could perhaps 
do even better than that, we could say uh, data location is this type and instruction location is this type data value is this type and let's save now I should complain that these are unused but I'm going to use them now so this should point to data location this should point to an instruction location this should point to a data value and this should point to data location. So whether or not you like this is up to you. Maybe you think it's obfuscating it a little bit, what's happening. Or maybe you like the fact that we can give semantic names instead of uh, these generic type names. I don't really know what I think, but uh, we'll leave it like this for now. Now we want to define a run function, which takes a program. And we can even say it, own, it takes ownership of the program. And then it will produce nothing except for the output of the function, you know, because there are instructions to print things. Let's save again. Now these should go away. It doesn't realize that we're using them, which is a bit sad. But anyway, so now we can run the program. And how do we do that? And here we have a first version of a first untested version of the run function that given a program can run it. So the first thing we do is that we check that we're not at the end of the program. Then we get the current instruction. Then depending on the instruction, we do different things. If it's move right, we just increment the data pointer. If it's move left, we decrement the data pointer. If it's increment operator, we increment the data field. If it's decrement operator, we decrement the data field. If it's print, we first get the current data value and turn it into an ASCII. Then we print it. If it's read, we read a character from the standard input and we put that data onto the data tape. If it's an open bracket, we look at the current value. If the current value is zero, we go to the next closing bracket. Otherwise, we do nothing. If it's a closing bracket, we look at the current value. If it's not zero, we jump back to the previous, immediately preceding open bracket. Actually, there's a bug here. Uh, in my implementation. If it's a comment, we do nothing. And finally, once we have handled the instruction, we can increment the instruction pointer. So there's a couple of things. And one is that here we should actually decrement the instruction pointer because we want the next instruction that is handled to be the open bracket that we just jumped to. So another way to handle that is just to make this one jump one further back. So let's actually do that. And now these closing and open jumps I have implemented down below. Also all the other helper functions. Most of them are quite obvious. The only thing we have to remember is that this data tape is a hash map. And when we look at some index for the data pointer, then there can either be something, then we just return that, or there can be nothing. And then we have to remember that that means it is zero. Now let's go to the closing. So what we need to do here is say, let a bracket count equal to one and we will say not um, not while the instruct current instruction is is not equal to a close bracket. We will say while uh, oops, we will say while bracket count is greater than zero. We do this, and if this is the case. 
that we see a closing bracket, then we can go ahead and decrement the bracket count. That way, if we see something like an open bracket, some, something. Now, when you read this, it's probably clear that also you can see from my highlighting that it's the outermost brackets that match. So we have to make sure that when we are looking for the matching closing bracket that we don't accidentally pick this one. We do that by keeping track of, uh, of a count of how many opening brackets we've seen. Uh, and that way um, we know exactly when to stop. Now the same thing needs to be done here. So let me grab that one and put it in. And we will also grab this and we will say while bracket count is, let's do it uh, kind of uh, symmetrically. So we'll say while it's less than zero and then this one will be minus one. Then we decrement the counter. And if, uh, if we see something that is an open bracket, then the bracket count should go up. And there we have it. That is a program runner. But before we go too crazy with that, let's test some of these functions, particularly this bracket jumping. The first thing we have is a couple of simple tests. We make some uh, source code which just has a brackets. We don't care about what's inside, only that it's correct source code. Then we tokenize it. We make a new program. I also added a function uh, here, a new function that uh, takes a set of tokens and makes a new program. If we go back here, we make the program. Then the program counter should be at zero, i.e. the first one. Uh, the just the instruction counter, then we jump to the closing and that should put the instruction counter at the end of the source code. So jump backward works the same. We use the same source code, make the program again. At this point before we test, we turn, we, we move the instruction pointer to the end of the source code. Uh, so here, then we jump back to open and at the end the instruction pointer should be zero. So let's try to run that. There's a lot of warnings. We are going to ignore that, but as you can see, the tests worked. And what we also want to do is to check that um, it works when we have nested brackets. So we have here jump forward, jump backward, jump forward. And we're going to make one that we call nested, which is going to have uh, some more program instructions in here. And this time the code should work the same way. And here um, we do the same thing. Doesn't really matter what we put here, shouldn't matter. And we do the same thing. So let's run the test again. This time the tests failed, which is interesting. Uh, let's run them again just to check. So we failed at jump forward nested. The left side is 13, the right side is 18. So at 194. Um, which means that the instruction pointer didn't go all the way, which is very sad. Let's take a look at the code again. So jump to closing. Ah, it's of course because um, we forgot to account for the fact that the thing we're looking at could also be an open bracket. And if that's the case, bracket count has to be incremented. 
the same thing here, but the other way around. Actually, uh, now I did that again. We can copy all of this and reuse it. So I'm not really sure what I did there when I copied. So uh, let's delete that. And the same thing should work here because we did it symmetrically. So now let's uh, run the tests and now they are passing. So that's uh, pretty good. The other functions we have are kind of almost too simple to care about. So let's instead go back to main and uh, write a small program. So let's say that the code is something like let's increment the data pointer four times and then print it out. So I want to add another helper function which we will call compile. It should just take some source code and return a program. And the way it's going to work is we will first get the tokens by tokenizing the source and then we will return a new program from the tokens. And we don't have tokenize available here. So I'm going to add that. I should probably add it up here. Use create parser, tokenize. And now if we go back to main, I can say, let's make a program that is a program that we compile from the code. If I can type correctly, let's save everything. We don't have we don't have the code, the program available quite yet. So I will do this. And now we have the program. Now we can simply run the program. And it's complaining here that the variable does not need to be mutable. I don't think that is right. Let's go into the program and look. Okay, I guess not. So that's it. Let's run it, which I think I have bound to this key combination. And we don't see any output, which is really weird. Program finished. So it does print that. Let's take another look at the print. And that's that looks correct. So let's look in the parser. We have a dot, it turns it into a print. And since we are here, let's try to Try to tokenize the code and then we will print it. To do that, we need to use the parser. Let's run it again. So we have four increments and one print, which is correct. So there's nothing there. So let's try to do this and run it. It's like it never gets to this point, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. 
So for some reason, it thinks it's at the end already, from the very beginning. Uh, so that is obviously a bug that we can go find. So it's wrong. The instruction pointer should not be less than the length. Uh, that is obviously wrong. So actually it should be that the instruction pointer is greater than or equal to length, I think. So let's run it again. It's printing uh, something. It's printing a, a D. I don't know if that's correct. So let's try to make a more complicated pro program. Uh, if we can print a hundred, then that should be a recognizable character. So let me um, actually let me format this. And now let's let's. So I don't want to make a hundred pluses, but I am okay with making ten. So let's say five. One, two, three, four, five. And now I can go into a loop. So we have ten here. And that means when it enters the loop, it will see that there's 10, not zero. So it will go into the loop. Then I can move one to the right, which is where I want to keep my data, so to speak. So I'm gonna uh, increment it 10 times. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Then I will go one back, decrement and close the loop. Finally, I will go uh, one to the right, so I read the right data. So what did I do here? It's kind of weird if you never try to think about one of these programs. So I'm just using two points in the data tape right now. I'm using point X and point, yeah, let's say I'm using two points. So in the beginning, they're both zero. Then I it 10 times. Then I go into the loop. And the first thing in the loop is I move the data pointer. So instead of modifying the first one, I modify the second one. Then I increment that 10 times. So in the first iteration of the loop, I have 10 in both. Um, then, as you can see, I go one back. I move the data pointer to the left. So I, now I'm back over at this 10. Still this 10 here, so I'm back here. Uh, but in the f but then I decrement it, so I should put nine. Then we go to here. We see that ah, it's not zero, so I better jump back. Then I go. I've jumped up. I jumped back. I move the data point to the right, so now I'm at this one again. And Then I increment that 10 times. I go over here, I turn that into an eight and I increment this 10 times again and so on. So I think now you see the pattern. I'm always incrementing the one on the right and decrementing the one on the left. And when the left is zero, then I exit the loop and I have a hundred in the second uh, register, so to speak. So if we run this, uh, we print a D. Amazing. So let's try to print an A. It should be 97. Now we have an A. And then we can print a, that's not what I wanted. Let's, uh, so now we can print a B. Now we can print the entire alphabet like this. And A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So that is actually should be a full interpreter for brain fog. I want to change this to be just print because then when we actually run the program, it um, looks nicer. 
Although now I want to do this. So there you have it. This is a brainfuck interpreter in very few lines of code. The interesting thing compared to my uh, more complicated object oriented language is that the full program can be modeled quite concisely with like, here is the data of the program. Mm -hmm. And then we simply modify that mm -hmm. data. In the object oriented language, we have very complicated structures with resolvers and syntax trees and an interpreter that carries internal state and things like that. But perhaps it could be modeled like this, that we have a program that kind of has a list of instructions that would be the syntax tree. It also has something equivalent to the data tape that would be the environment and all the nested environments. But that in itself kind of poses a problem because sub expressions in the syntax tree, they will have their own environment. So it's not really easy to see exactly how we could make the same structure for a more complicated language, but at least it's food for thought. Thank you for watching and if you uh, try to build your own interpreter for BrainFuck, uh, let me know in the comments and uh, see you in the next video.